Have you ever pondered what you would do in an apocalypse-like scenario? Let's say your local government had completely shifted systems and many of the laws that were in place are no longer there or protected. Did you think to ensure that you and your loved ones had enough materials and supplies and protection in order to outlive this said chaos? Or did you think about using the chaos in this said scenario in order to gain power or control for yourself? Now, I ask this question primarily to those in more established governments. Perhaps this question is a bit more applicable to those uh, in the West. Those who have lived through recent political turmoils certainly didn't have to think these sorts of questions and instead had to live the realities of it. The reality is no government lasts forever. This is supposed to be a video about the late Roman Republic, but I'm no historian. I'm merely a history fan, a history buff, you could say. I'm, I've never, I didn't go to school for history. I've studied history as a hobby. And having said that I'm no historian, there, in the case that there's some historical inaccuracies, you're getting the histosophy version of the late Roman Republic, my version, my, my personal interpretation. So if you guys don't like it, too bad. <laughs> Let's paint the scene of the late Roman Republic in the late second century BCE. The Roman Republic at this time has just come off three major wars. The three wars with Carthage, known as the Punic Wars. And as the outcome of this war, Rome had gained vast amounts of land and power and wealth. The best thing I can compare what had happened to the Rome was similar to what America had undergone after the First and Second World War. Prior to the First World War, America was this rising power, but they were no great power like many of the nations were in Europe at that time. And after the First and Second World War, America was very much this global superpower. Rome, prior to the Punic Wars, was this rising power in the Mediterranean, but they weren't this global power just quite yet. And after sacking Carthage in the Third Punic War, they had become the dominant Mediterranean power. They had, from a military view, they had no power that was uh, really threatening Rome. Rome, at this time, had also undergone many cultural changes, naturally, when you get a lot of land and wealth. Around this time, they had gone through several wars uh, after the Punic Wars. They had conquered many of the Hellenistic kingdoms, further infusing Hellenistic ideals with Rome's ideals. The Greeks were, this at this time, a bit more lavish than they were, let's say, 400 BCE or even 500 BCE uh, during its golden time. And Rome had, had started to take this, I, I guess, more decadent ideal, this decadent influence into their society. Prior to the further merging with these Hellenistic kingdoms, many of the rulers, the aristocracy, the Senate, came from much more of a rural background, farmers, per se. And afterwards, they started to get much, much more decadent with their lifestyle choices. The best way I can put it is that the Romans, prior to gaining all this wealth, at least their aristocracy anyway, were likened to that of, let's say, steel, steel factory owners or, you know, some sort of construction boss, right? You know, still wearing jeans, maybe a nice pair of boots, right? Still wearing the hard hat on. And... After the merging, after the further merging of these Hellenistic kingdoms and uh, amassing all this wealth, they start to become the, the aristocracy. Anyway, start to look more like businessmen. They start to look much more like think of a modern day CEO instead of that. Instead of the boot cut jeans with a nice pair of boots, they got on suits and a a big cup of Starbucks in their hand. And with this wealth also came a huge divide between the common folk and the aristocracy. The the plebeians, the plebs, the there was a trend of growing disconnection between the very, very rich, the very, very powerful, and the lowest people of Rome at that time. And it, it's really prevalent in what they would call the servile wars, slave revolts. There were three of them exactly, with the third one being held by the legendary figure of Spartacus, who had taken out four legions. Slaves, gladiator slaves, had taken out four legions. I want you to imagine a scenario if you're, let's say, in the Western world like me in America, where 
local militias, local bands of people take over, kill armies of people, kill your local police. What sort of chaos would arise from, from such a scenario? And, and what would cause such a scenario to arise? The Roman Republic, the government was, was set up in a, in a very particular way that really showed how much it was, it was built for, I guess, a small city-state. This small city-state had just gained large amounts of land and wealth, and now has to balance this huge lump of land with this system that was really just meant for a small city-state. Not that the government never thought about expanding, but it certainly had its pitfalls when it came to governing such a huge amount of land. And the Romans would see through that and would also work their own systems in order to manage their own huge lumps of land. Very characteristic of that of like a, a crime boss mafia. The American founding fathers studied the Roman system and the Roman Republic when it came to creating their own system of government, establishing their own check checks and balances and, and seeing where the Romans could have improved in certain areas. And with their establishment of their own checks and balances system, hope to resolve that issue. But obviously, we're, we're talking about Rome today, so we're going to see the pitfalls in this system that the Roman Republic was. There was the Senate, which you would call the Roman aristocracy, and the tribunate, who represented the common folk. There would be this class of equestrians, you know, high-standing, hard-working people who the aristocracy welcomed, but as long as there weren't too many of them, that was fine. Now, with this huge amount of land and wealth that the Romans would inherit, the aristocracy obviously being in charge would do everything in its ability to ensure that their own people, their own kind, would take this new wealth for themselves. And many of the lands that they had taken, you know, called for rights, called for, called for citizenship, wanted to be Roman, right? The Roman ideal was spreading after some time. This would not sit right with many of the lower class citizens or non-citizens, people of these colonies that yearn for Roman citizenship. The Roman Republic also ran on two consuls. The consul is, is very uh, similar to that of the role of the president here in America, but there was two of them as a way of managing checks and balances. And the presidents themselves, the consuls, at times didn't really agree or like each other. Whilst the US has a president and a vice president, they come from the same party and they work together. Now think the two presidents of the United States being one from one party and one from the opposing party. You have a Democratic president and a Republican president running the country. What could go wrong? Imagine if, if Trump and Biden led the country together at the same time, what would happen? Now, this wasn't always the case. At times the consuls did work together, but there were plenty of times where the consuls did oppose each other. Uh, they also didn't hold these offices forever, right? They had a limited amount of time in office. So naturally, you would take as much action as possible in this small window of time to create a legacy for yourself. This often led to good things and bad things, but action was the theme of the Romans. Now, I'm going to mention some quotes here, but they're very summarized quotes. Many economic disparities and political upheavals would eventually lead to the gradual decline and collapse of this republic. As a summarized quote from Plutarch, quote, the violence of the parties once set afoot was not to be curbed, end quote. Now that we have a bit of background in regards to this era of time, we're going to go ahead and start with our story. And our story is going to start with two brothers, the Gracchi brothers. And we're going to start with Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus, elected tribune in 133 BCE. Tribune is the head representative of the plebeians. The tribune was in place to check the aristocracy. Uh, you couldn't go assaulting a tribune. That was seen as a very bad thing to do in Rome, as long as you were within the Roman borders. And this Tiberius Gracchus character had initiated a series of reforms that would dramatically alter the fabric of Roman society. His primary concern was the agrarian law. Now, with all this new land in Rome, the common folk, the plebeian folk, was hoping they would get a bit of, you know, a bit of share from the Roman elite with this new wealth and, and land that they had just gained, right? Naturally, 
people go off fighting the wars for these elites, they would hope they get some of the spoils of war. And what would happen actually to many of the common folk was they, a lot of the soldiers, they were farmers and they would go off hundreds of miles out from their farm, their land in order to go fight these wars. And what would happen was when they would come back to their home, not only would they find themselves not gaining any of this new spoils of war that Rome had gained, but they would find their farmland not having been taken care of, desecrated, their families having been taken away. Many of these soldiers actually gained resentment serving the Roman legionnaires as it had taken time away from their lives. And in return, Rome didn't give them anything that had actually taken their land. So Tiberius Gracchus, in order to gain support of uh, the common folk, these soldiers including, his primary goal was to was to pass this ag agrarian law, which aimed to redistribute public land to the poor, which would address the growing economic disparity. Tiberius argued, quote, the wild beasts of Italy have their caves to retire to, but the men who bear arms and expose their lives for the safety of their country enjoy nothing in it but the air and light. Now, naturally, the nobility would go ahead and give Tiberius all sorts of opposition, but Tiberius' appeal to the populace gained substantial traction. The nobility were not very fond of this Tiberius character, and many scholars would actually argue that they didn't so much dislike Tiberius's goal, his agrarian law, but they just disliked Tiberius's character because he was so aggressive, he was outgoing, and he was using... Tiberius was attempting to use the system in order to get his law passed, properly use the system anyway, and he was actually successful with it. This old money aristocracy did not like how their system was being used against them. Now, Tiberius, this, this champion of the people, he, he was liked by the common folk, would sadly die. Tiberius' death at the hands of the mob led by senators was a chilling prelude to the Republic's downfall. There was a band of senators that would go and find Tiberius. But uh, prior to his death, actually, Tiberius running for uh, re-election for Tribunate had worn some cloth around him, common cloth, kind of to symbolize how if he was not Tribunate again, he was a dead man. And before he would actually be a Tribunate once again, a mob of senators had gone and killed him. The Senate of Rome had gone ahead and killed this champion of the people, this person who was trying to help out the common folk of the Roman Republic. Imagine a figure in your society, an Alex Jones type character, going ahead and being stoned to death by your local governors, and what sort of upheaval and trouble that might cause. Tiberius' death at the hands of the mob led by senators was a chilling prelude to the Republic's downfall. The assassination marked the first time that such violence had been used as a political tool in Rome, setting a dangerous precedent. Now, this is the first death in this political war, this social war that would go on in Rome prior to the fall of the Republic. Plutarch paints him very much like a hero. Plutarch, being a, a Greek, of course, had very democratic ideals. So naturally, he would be on the side of someone like Tiberius Gracchus. But to the common folk, most of the common folk did view him as this savior, as this person who was trying to help out the Roman common folk and get some of the wealth that is being hoarded by the aristocracy spread out amongst the common folk. And he was trying to do it in a very legitimate way, using the Roman system, not doing anything illegal. And sadly, he would face a faith that just goes to show the growing disconnect between the Roman aristocracy and the, the Roman common folk. Now, Tiberius Gracchus would have a younger brother named Gaius, Gaius Gracchus. They were separated by about 10 years. And following his brother's death, Gaius Gracchus took up the mantle in 123 BCE with even more radical proposals, right? He had watched his brother die. Now Gaius, watching his brother Tiberius try to play this political game in a more legitimate and fair manner, would learn from his brother's experience watching the ultimate faith of his brother being killed by the very senators that Tiberius was trying to work with. Gaius would also create reforms, and his reforms extended beyond agrarian issues to include equestrian rights and the founding of colonies. He also f sought to address military injustices, stating, quote, according to Appian, no man shall be put to death either in peace or war without a trial. 
Gaius's laws not only broaden his ideal, but also deepen the elite's animosity towards him. So the elites already didn't like his brother. So in comes in the younger brother trying to do what his older brother had done, but in a much more extreme way. <laughs> Naturally, Gaius is out here trying to get himself killed. And, you know, eventually he would get killed like his brother. Gaius's career ended in bloodshed in 121 BCE amid escalating tensions. Gaius and his followers were killed and his reforms largely dismantled. Now, with Tiberius, they actually went ahead and passed his laws, right? They killed Tiberius, but they still passed many of the laws that he put out there in regards to his agrarian laws, which really goes to show how much the elites just did not like Tiberius's character. They disliked his character much more than the laws that he had actually put out there. The rising descent towards the elites, they didn't like that. But with Gaius, they would kill him and then go ahead and reverse all the laws he put out there. The vile suppression of the Gracchi brothers movements highlighted the Senate's increasing desperation and its shift from legal authority to brute force to maintain control. What would you do in such a scenario? Let's say you're a common folk in Rome. You're looking for a bit more rights, right? You're watching how wealthy these elites are. You're poor. You're barely able to feed your own family. And now comes in these politicians that are trying to get you some of your own rights, some material for yourself, some money, some wealth, some land. And the very government that you're meant to live under and listen to goes ahead and uh, kills these characters. How would you view this scenario? The reaction to the Gracchi reforms was mixed. The common people, especially the urban poor and veterans, saw the brothers as champions of their cause, a sentiment echoed by Plutarch, quote, the people looked upon the Gracchi as their patrons and protectors, end quote. However, the Senate and the traditionalists viewed them as dangerous who threatened the stability of the state. Cicero, reflecting on this period, lamented the erosion of traditional values, noting that, Quote, the Republic was not any longer governed by its ancient customs. Death of the Gracchi symbolized a significant shift in Roman politics, where laws and traditions could now be overridden by violence and populism. This marked the beginning of a series of power struggles that would eventually lead to the Republic's fall. 